Thanks for tuning in to the latest in the Sydney Institute's uh, virtual meetings and discussions at a time of pandemic. And today, Tim Wilson makes a welcome return to the Sydney Institute. I think it's about the fourth occasion he's been here. He's well known to many of you as um, the former Human Rights Commissioner, of course, the member for Goldstein since 2016, Chairman of the House of Representatives Economic Committee and a fellow of the P. M. Glynn Institute at the Australian Catholic University. And for that reason, he's here today on the occasion of the publication of his book, The New Social Contract, Renewing the Liberal Vision for Australia. And uh, we welcome Tim here today to talk about uh, liberalism after the pandemic. Thank you. Did I get Goldstein right? It's Goldstein, but that's okay. I'll fix it next. Well, thank you very much, Jared, for the opportunity to come and speak at the Cindy Institute uh, again. Um, as you know, this is, I think, is my fourth visit. The last time I was here was to talk about the tension of issues around religion. I think the time before that, it was in the context of free speech. Uh, and I think another time I came and spoke about, um, uh, I think, a discussion around marriage equality, which, if nothing else, suggests that whenever we're coming to the Sydney Institute, we're always talking about the future and uh, the contribution that the Sydney Institute makes, uh, yourself and Anne, uh, in leading some of these discussions and debates and ideas in a non-partisan way remain very welcome. Um, and as a parochial Victorian who will never be ashamed to be a Victorian, but is ashamed of his government at the moment, uh, it's always nice to be uh, another state and contributing to the debate in Sydney. Recently, we re released the new Social Contract, a book that focuses on the future uh, of Australia and Australian liberalism. And it did so and was written in the pre-COVID era, but it made it warnings about the direction of Australian society and the challenges we face. And all that has happened since is COVID has brought forward many of the concerns that have been raised of an imbalanced society, which is going to create challenges for the survival of liberalism and of course, for the sustainability of a cohesive nation. Political stability over the coming decade depends on providing opportunities for Australians who want to go, while respecting the security of those who've had a go. We have a health crisis that we need to lead and steer through now. There will, of course, be an economic crisis to come. But the much bigger challenge in the medium term is the political crisis that many Western liberal democracies will face, including Australia. All governments are ultimately evaluated by their citizens on their capacity to meet the aspirations of their population. The ability of governments to strive towards the fundamental objective has been, this fundamental objective has been significantly hindered by the COVID-19 pandemic and the twin health and economic crisis that it's created. And while the health security of older Australians has been imperiled by a virus that uh, discriminately impacts people over the age of 60, a weakened economy will limit the opportunities for young Australians to achieve personal financial security. Unemployment will rise. The very structure of some sectors will change. And of course, we know with sectors that are dependent on people movement, which is so much of the Australian economy, until we get international borders open, the opportunity for revival will be slim. And on top of that, we will not be just in a race to be more competitive in our own economy. It will be against the backdrop of a global race of competitiveness. And this is going to raise very serious challenges about how Australians and the Australian government and states and society hold itself together. The fraying of the social contract itself around what people can reasonably expect, what Australians can reasonably expect from their government and what it's in a position to be able to deliver. Now, the concept of a social contract is one that people uh, may not be familiar with. Figures such as Thomas Hobbes, John Locke and Jean-Jacques Rousseau intellectualised the idea of a social contract as something that provides legitimacy for governments, freedoms for citizens and order for society. But it's about an understanding. It's a broad concept which articulates an underlying settlement between the people and their government about how society should function to ensure citizens benefit broadly from the existence of the state itself. 
Australian liberalism has understood this settlement as a balance between the freedom of the individual and the empowerment of the individual, which shifts and adapts to the context of the times. Individuals should be free to live out their lives unimpeded by government. Interference, but government intervention is warranted when individuals are unable to stand on their own two feet. It is pivotal five book narrative on the Australian liberal tradition, starting with the land of dreams, how Australians won their freedom. A former member for Goldstein and uh, Howard government minister, Dr. David Kemp highlighted the importance of the social contract to colonial settlement. Kemp argued the idea of the social contract in colonial Australia touched on an aspect of the way societies worked that could not be ignored and involved such terms as the protection of the liberty of subjects and their property. Similarly, Paul Kelly's thesis about the Australian settlement in the end of certainty reflected the post-Federation idea of a social contract founded by practical men striving for income, justice, employment and security and the establishment of institutions and policies to achieve it. This liberal understanding of the social contract carried through to the seminal years of Menzian economic development, which saw Australia consecrate its position as a modern society. In his memoirs, The Measure of the Years, Sir Robert Menzies describes how the post-war social contract recognised that is the individual whose energies produce progress and that all social benefits derive from his efforts. To that end, Menzies' government focused on promoting home ownership to encourage Australia's little, platoon, little family platoons to take a stake in society as little capitalists. And for each generation, the social contract has been renewed and people can point to many moments where it's been shifted and renewed based on the context of the times. Our history demonstrates that each new generation has been richer than the last, inheriting a stronger economy a more forward-looking society and cohesive nation from which to build their own security and opportunity. And at a global level, the last 25 years has seen over a billion people lift themselves out of poverty while technological advancements have worked to improve our quality of life. However, it presents enormous challenges around the consequences of globalisation and what I call the era of equity extraction that we've come to the end to, which highlights how there can be tension that exists within society because we've eaten into the equity of institutions. At the same time, we've found young workers have been increasingly funneled into parts of the economy which are low growth but have high employment requirements, as opposed to the mining and agriculture sectors which create new wealth but sometimes have different skill sets. Similarly, the number of Australians enrolled in domestic universities each year has grown rapidly from just over 600,000 in 2000 to over a million in 2016. Most students who do have, uh, do have work are employed in low-skilled sectors like retail, hospitality and tourism because they're accessible and they're flexible. But the increase in student work and supply has been matched by consummate demand in the economy, leading to even greater casualisation and, unfortunately, what we're seeing increasingly of is lower wages for young Australians. Since 2000, the Productivity Commission recently outlined that there has been a decline in wages for uh, younger Australians under the age of 35. But more challenging in the COVID era is that people employed in those sectors are of course on the front line of those who have lost jobs. And of course, those who are in the service economy and particularly, shall we say, in the froth of the latte economy have been those most punished as a consequence of the measures introduced by governments. This of course, creates serious issues about their sense of opportunity and frankly, justice in a society about their opportunity to be successful in their own right, be able to have a job that pays well, that reflects their effort, to have a family and ultimately to buy their own home. And the tax system unnecessarily penalises income, which uh, ultimately is the primary source of uh, how young Australians get ahead. While it preferences and favours a structurally imbalanced way, growth that comes off the basis of capital, which favours established and older Australians. In 1989, an average under 65 household earning $100,000 per annum was paying 1.5 .5 times more tax than a household over 65 earning the same income today. Today, they pay 2.4 times more tax. Now, demographic changes have been seen older Australians draw more from the public purse than ever before but they have not increased their share of the overall contribution to the tax base. Monetary policy has worsened the situation by inflating asset prices, particularly housing 
disproportionate to incomes. With all these forces depressing working age incomes, many younger Australians increasingly feel like the deck is stacked against them. This has a negative knock-on effect in their confidence in democracy and, of course, the institutions. The underlying diagnosis of these trends and structural divides has created in Western liberal democracies a focus on what is dividing our communities. America's Charles Murray wrote a book called Coming Apart, looking at the state of white America. Britain's David Goodhart's focus on the road to somewhere looked at the gap between those who are somewheres and, no, uh, somewheres and everywheres based on their professional capacity and they're able to live out their lives. And Matthew Lesher's Democracy in a Divided Australia focused specifically on the gap associated with ge geography. Each outlines a slow slogan to define the divide. Murray's is the divide between Americans living in super zips over the new lower class based on access to economic, institutional and cultural power. Goodhart's British anywheres and somewheres around uh, people's potential to uh, harness the opportunities of globalisation or Lesher's Australia's inners and outers based on the broad benefits of proximity to capital cities. But nowhere is there a divide clearer and the erosion of a liberal social contract than the divide between under 35s and over 65s. And it's an under-analyzed area. Despite our yearning for individuality, most people's lives exist along a relatively linear plane from an opportunity stage of life where people pursue education, employment, family, and the security of your first home, to a security stage managing about uh, securing your own home, managing retirement savings, and of course, the maintenance of your health and in aged care. People's capacity to progress through these stages of life and that public policy reflect their concerns is critical to the sustainability and the stability of our society. By example, a recent news poll identified that young people were the most concerned about government increasing their debt, while older Australians were also concerned about, were most concerned about the health risks of COVID-19. This sort of divide isn't new. A 2012 Pew Research Centre survey found young Americans under 30 were most concerned about the size of the deficit, whereas older Americans were more concerned about supporting Social Security and Medicare, essentially which one impacted them. There has always, of course, been generational divide between the priorities of younger and older voters encapsulated in the quip that we use colloquially here. If you don't vote Labor under 40, you have no heart. If you don't vote Liberal over 40, you have no brain. The practical pro political problem for Liberals is that the conversion from, young, from voting with your heart to your brain occurs because of changing life priorities. They're increasingly less likely to occur or are being delayed. A 2014 research found, a Reason Foundation study into the attitudes of US millennials found that many identified as being independent because they are, quote, social liberals and fiscal centrists, with the potential to become more fiscally conservative as they age. Critically, the study found the core driver for people to go to, on a journey of conversion from identifying as politically independent to politically centre-right occurred when they got married or they bought a home and both often in the same circumstance. These two life events are typically intertwined with people's shifting sentiment from the opportunity stage of life towards having something to secure and to conserve. A 20, uh, 2012 Oxford economic study found intergenerational redistribution tension is intrinsic in life cycle models. Young cohorts have few assets and wages and the main sources of income. Older generations work less and prefer a higher rate of return from their savings. And as a consequence, they have distorted, or different, I should say more clearly, priorities about what they want to see from public policy. And the same basic trends appear in Australia. ABS census data shows that home ownership rates are highest in coalition electorates and lowest in Labor and Greens electorates, funnily enough, along the same political divide. Additionally, ANU data clearly shows that 46% of homeowners vote Liberal, 33% vote Labor, and only 6% vote Green. The concern should not just be about its impact will have on electoral fortunes, but on the width of mainstream political discourse. A 2020 study by academics David Adler and Ben Ansell found that populist voting behaviour correlated with the Brexit referendum and France's 2017 presidential election 
where areas that have gained from house price inflation are far less likely to vote for populist causes or parties than areas that are being excluded from those gains. Former British Conservative MP David Willits wrote in the book The Pinch that fears about our society and the strain on our economy reflect a breakdown in the balance between the generations, leading to a more ra radical younger polity. Younger voters overseas who flock to support the unreconstructed socialists of Jeremy Corbyn and Bernie Sanders provide clear evidence of this occurring. Now, Australia has largely avoided this fate so far, but the key difference following uh, the global financial crisis for both the United Kingdom and the United States was a much clearer uh, unemployment prospects for younger Americans and younger Britons, which has only led and exacerbated that, and we are now on the doorsteps of a potentially much ra more radical political uh, movement in Australia. We did see some of it, though, in the last election. Though Bill Shorten attempted to stoke the intergenerational divides in 2019, much of Labor's election policy platform sought to encourage larger cash flows into their organised capital masters industry superannuation, but it was draped with a pro-youth veneer. Greater government revenue would be seized by harnessing the interests of retirees by higher taxes. As demographer Bernard Salt wrote, while it is true that boomers saw off this challenge at the May 2019 election, underlying age-based tensions remain, and the data backs it up. At the 2004 election, nearly 50% of Australians under 35 voted Liberal. Today, it is 23%. ANU's electoral study found while younger voters are moving further to the left, older voters are moving further to the right and is consistent with a growing generational divide in the voting behaviour of younger and older Australians. Now, of course, we should not want a society where there are divides at all, and we certainly should not want where the young is pitted against the old, or the old against the young. The very principle of being a steward of a society and a leader is to understand how to bring people together and to recognise that we have to have a society that finds a sense of place and purpose for everybody. The challenge to sustain the existing Australian social contract is that with home ownership rates declining each year, the personal stake of younger Australians in supporting the current pillars of our society is slowly being eroded. Melbourne's University's Hilda study found that home ownership rates amongst the young dropped by nearly one percentage point every year between 2002 and 35.7% to 25.2% by 2014. This trend is only likely to get worse. Recent Productivity Commission data shows that between 2008 and 2018, incomes for people aged between 15 and 24 fell by 1.6% every year, while incomes for those aged 65 rose 3.2% a year. And that was pre-COVID. So it is only going to get worse and compounded as the gap between the capacity for young people to work um, in proportion to their home ownership rates and their capacity to build their lives will get worse. Part of the problem lies with our vocational training system, which has been ill-equipped to open new and alternate career opportunities for a young workforce. And many people have found a system that offers over 1,400 qualifications and a huge variation in fees between states too co incoherent to navigate. Instead, reverting to the conventional university option, the number of vocational qualifications seeking students fell over 1,550 uh, in 2012 to under 1,200 in 2017. Part of the problem is that the TAFE courses have been hollowed out by state governments. Vet funding has fallen by 25% on average across all states and territories except Tasmania over the past decade. And the current National Agreement for Skills and Workforce Development simply see, uh, hands uh, $1.5 to states without the clarity necessary. Positively, in the Job Maker Plan, the Prime Minister has highlighted skills as an area which will be reformed as part of a post-COVID-19 recovery. This is critical. As we recover from COVID-19, given that we already know about the scarring effect of recessions on young workers, recessions typically burn those in the early stages of their career with persistently lower levels of employment and wages. And there is ongoing compounding effects for the remainder of their career. And while commonly thought to last a decade, researcher Jesse Rothstein of the University of California, Berkeley, has found evidence that lower unemployment rates may in fact be lifelong. Meanwhile, since the GFC, central banks have continued to engage in monetary expansion that props up asset values compared to incomes. 
And it would be worse if the Alan Kohler generation got their way through the adoption of modern monetary theory. Inflation is not registering consumer products because there's been counterbalancing deflation from technological innovation, efficiency, competition, and global pricing. But there has been inflation as a consequence of uh, uh, quantitative easing, which has only harmed young Australians to protect the interests of the wealthy. In their 2019 paper, A Model of the Australian Housing Market, the Reserve Bank of Australia's Trent Saunders and Peter Tulip outlined that inflation from monetary expansion had instead been absorbed in the least, uh, least mobile and internationally tradable asset, housing. Of course, the result is fine if you own your own home, like myself. We just see rising house prices, but it essentially boosts the wealth of those who are established at the expense of young Australians who face higher barriers to home ownership. Data from the Institute of Health and Welfare found that home ownership for Australians aged 30 to 34 has dropped by 14 percentage points from 64 to 50% since the 1970s, and 13 points for those aged 25 to 29 from 50 to 37%. This is why a reprioritisation from 20 year olds focusing on their superannuation balances to enabling them to buy their own home is so critical. It is simply madness to think that a 20 year old should be saving for their retirement in 50 years into the future when they get the compound benefits of home ownership for more than 50 years. And of course, compounding these trends, the disproportionate benefit many young Australians have gained from emergency spending programs like JobKeeper and the JobSeeker coronavirus supplement, which have long tails and legacy effects. Data provided by the ABS reveals, reveals that workers under the age of 20 actually saw their wages increase by an average of 16% from March 14 into May. And for people aged 20 to 29, their wages shrunk over the same period, but a lower rate than anyone else under 60. This is worrying for those Liberals awake to what economists call hysterious, the idea that temporary increases in public expenditure reframe popular expectations in a way that makes it increasingly difficult to undo. These implications for a Liberal constituency, when feelings for disenchantment with the status quo combine with a beneficial experience under an alternative debt-funded socialised economic system, are obvious. For Liberals, the task is to illustrate that dramatic state inventions during COVID-19 were fundamentally temporary in their nature. They will not lead to any real-world economic recovery. They will only dampen productivity with worsening inflation. That doesn't mean that there isn't a, port, a role for government in COVID-19 recovery. There critically is, because the need for security is going to become essential for investment. But it has to be one that creates the opportunities for the next generation of Australians. The extent of the divide in attitudes and outlooks between the young and old has led historians Niall Ferguson and Ike Freeman to warn in the Atlantic recently of the coming generation war. And one of the key deficits um, amongst liberalism's advocates in Australia is their failure to recognise that in the 21st century they need cultural currency more than ever before. And the largest voting demographic in Australia is 18 to 35. And part of the reason why people are increasingly voting with their heart rather than with their mind is that their more, connected world, their more connected world has deeply embedded ideas of equality and fairness in a national consciousness. And that must be at the heart of the fundamental pillars in which we build a future liberal society. Philosopher Edmund Burke recognised that each generation stewards their responsibility to each other and to future generations when he recognised the contract is not only between those who are living, but between those who are living, those who are dead, and those who are yet to be born. With millennials now the largest voting demographic, having eclipsed baby boomers, the social contract will have to be renewed to avoid a soft revolution at the ballot box that could dramatically and radically change the direction of liberal democracy in Australia. Ultimately, solutions rest in modern liberal economic reform, promote home ownership, harmonise and make the tax rates consistent, and especially after COVID-19, have an industrial relations and skills training system that gets young workers back into sustainable career pathways that have been always at the heart of the Australian promise. Um, so many thanks to Tim Wilson, the federal member for Goldstein and uh, the author of The New Social Contract. And uh, Tim has signed some copies of the book and we'll have that on sale uh, online um, soon after this talk goes out. So now we come to question and discussion and uh, we'll continue at the top until about the top of the hour. Thank you. Well, thanks, Tim. It's great to have you back again and uh, thanks. And 
I mean, how did a busy man like you do a book like this so quickly after the election? Uh, well, the ideas that ruminated um, at the heart of the book sit well beyond um, that time frame. I started thinking about the book um, and the ideas that sat behind it actually over a decade ago, uh, because what I saw was the increasing divide that was emerging politically between different generations of Australians and what their aspirations were. Uh, and particularly, uh, it came from the consequence of me going through my own experience around trying to buy my own home and how that was then compounding perceptions and concerns about a sense of justice within society and then uh, what was going to be necessary. It became obvious to me that most of the people who were able to buy their own home were actually people who got support and assistance from their parents. And what we were finding was increasingly that uh, younger Australians' capacity to achieve what used to be reasonable expectations about their own life uh, was dependent on their parents and their success. And that then the tax system went on and contributed and compounded that. And so it's uh, a discussion about not just where we are going to be now, but where we're going to be in a decade's time if we don't look at how we address many of these challenges, which were already there, which were going to lead, I believe, to a, a soft revolution at the ballot box and are now being brought forward by COVID-19. But to what extent is this relieved by people talk about the forthcoming death of the baby boom generation? Presumably, they're going to, people who have houses, they're going to pass on money to those who inherit from them. Will that make a difference? Well, it'll make, it'll make some difference, but we're still uh, aligning it against um, the realistic expectations of people being able to achieve their own success. You know, the whole basis of um, all the great opportunity of Australian society has always been that everybody meaningfully can go out about and try and achieve their own sense of success. We've never had a hereditary-based system of entitlement. In fact, that goes right to the core uh, of the, the foundation of the, mo the modern colony slash modern state. Uh, and what I'm arguing is that is now under serious pressure where we're almost creating a property owning class at the expense of the rest of the community. Uh, and of course, what we're having is people uh, living longer um, and as a consequence, the transfer uh, of that wealth, which is occurring, is happening later. Uh, and as a consequence, having people with a much longer period of their life cycle where they actually have no real sense of ownership of their society. And this is what's coming out in the data, which is why you're seeing younger people becoming more, not just more left-wing, they become more radically left-wing. We saw that particularly in the United States and uh, the United Kingdom under Corbyn and Sanders. They may not have won, but the numbers uh, showed that the under, all the underlying issues that they were addressing are still there. And the key thing that stopped that here has been high employment amongst young people. That is now going to very clearly become a problem. So I'm saying in three to five years' time, I think we're going to have serious political consequence and a political crisis associated with it. Now, looking back, it seemed to me in the Liberal Party, of which you're a member, obviously, uh, those Liberals who most openly spoke about the need for home ownership, I would think, was uh, Robert Menzies and mm. then John Howard, because Howard was very much influenced by the Menzies tradition because... Uh, Apart from reasons of equity, John Howard spoke about social stability. Yes. So you're in that tradition or you're in another kind of tradition? Well, I'm in that, I'm in that tradition, but um, uh, I'm a Menzian liberal and I very much identify with the values that sit at the heart of Menzies now. Um, uh, Menzies always talked about himself being a liberal and I really stress that. He always, and I go through quite a lot of length, why he didn't describe himself as a conservative because he saw conservatism as essentially um, creating a class-based society. And what Menzies very clearly said was, I'm a liberal because we're not in favour of that. We're in favour of a society where everybody can see their progress and future through. Um, and uh, Howard used different vocabulary around his political philosophy. Um, I'm going very much back to the ideals that Menzies articulated um, because home ownership is the foundation of social stability, but it's also the foundation of... Uh, uh, of social progress. Uh, if you go back and look at the 1949 uh, speeches given between Ben Chifley and, and uh, Sir Robert Menzies, and they're available on the Museum of Australian Democracy website, uh, Chifley was primarily interested in um, how we use housing as an opportunity to create a class of renters. Menzies talked about it being how do we create a class of homeowners, which is really the transfer of, uh, as in his 
his words around little cap, little platoons to little capitalists. So it's the foundation of a sustainable society and the strength of the society. Well, let's take up the Ben Chifley point. So Labor leader, he loses the election in 1949, and we'll come back to that in a minute. But you talk about Chifley wanted a generation of renters. Now, as I recall, growing up in Melbourne in the 50s, the Housing Commission, my father worked for it as a clerk, not a very senior person there, and there was a great emphasis on, that was the state government, but there was a great emphasis on housing commission under a liberal government at the time in Victoria, though there had been a Labor government uh, briefly in the 50s. It seems to me the left today is talking about going back to social housing. Mm. They want to go back to kind of the, the great emphasis on social housing. What's your objection to social housing? I mean, I know why you favour ownership, but why do you not see a future in social housing? Well, I think we all acknowledge that there's a place for social housing, but it's really where you want the emphasis and the norm to be. And one of the reasons we have such a high demand for social housing, uh, I mean, Victoria is a particularly unique example where there's been no real investment in social housing as one of the lowest rates uh, in the country, uh, is because, but the reason there's an emphasis there is because the private market isn't making housing affordable for Australians, young Australians who want to go and live out their lives. I don't want the default setting to be social housing and maybe you get home ownership. It should be home ownership and we have social housing as the exception if we need people who need additional support. And I think that's why we need to refocus and reprioritise how we see uh, uh, the, um, the role and the power of home ownership as part of the future of the country. And that means we've got to do some quite dramatic things as well in the space around home ownership to promote affordability. Now, we've had a massive decline at the moment um, as a consequence of, uh, of COVID in terms of demand um, because of lesser people movements and the like. But because younger Australians are going to take a big hit in their incomes, while monetary policy is keeping asset prices high and can potentially may continue to rise, we're actually going to see, even though housing's cheaper, younger Australians aren't necessarily going to be in a better place to be able to buy their own homes. Towards the end of your book, you did speak about the post-pandemic. And I think your argument is that um, the problems you uh, described before the pandemic will continue after the pandemic, but perhaps become more substantial. And faster. It, and faster. There are problems that I, I foresaw, I thought would emerge in about 2030, I now think will probably occur in about 2025. So now go back to your Member, so you remember in uh, what do you call it, southeast Melbourne? Sure, Bayside, Melbourne. So, so you're a liberal in Bayside, Melbourne, and uh, how's a liberal survive Dan Andrews' government post COVID? Well, a, a liberal will survive because in a two to three years' time, um, while hopefully we have the health consequences of COVID nineteen over the economic consequences of the decisions of this state government. Uh, will be so extreme that there's a realistic scenario that Australia might be in recession, but Victoria could be in depression um, and be quite separate because of the volume and the scale uh, of decisions that this government made um, and a complete abrogation of responsibility. Uh, under the current lockdown measures, uh, Victorians are less citizens of their state and they're more serfs of a, of a mad king. And uh, at some point, when people realise the full scale and cost of what he is doing, I think uh, it's going to be very clear to everybody that a different way is needed. So you go back to the Second World War and some harsh things were done. There was far too much concentration on certain matters. I mean, the harshest of all was probably the internment of the Italians, of many Italians who didn't deserve to be interned, but were interned. But by and large, the restrictions in Victoria now are much more substantial than the restrictions were in Victoria between, say, 1941 and 1945, uh, but without the same reason. So why is it that Victorians tolerate this, or many of them do? I, I think there's a number of factors that are playing out. Firstly, I think um, uh, Victorians have been um, demoralised by being kept at home for so long that they are not in a position to, to push back. There's a hope and willingness that, of course, it's successful and it works. But, of course, ultimately... Uh, as has occurred in other parts of the country, um, the federal government has been providing assistance and support to keep um, Victoria going through this difficult time. But we all know that it can't go on forever. And so it's only lessening the pain rather than the actual pain, which will reveal itself over the coming months. Well, as you know, the opposition in Victoria is a Liberal Party plus 
the Nationals, so the coalition. Yes. But if you are if you were the Liberal Party leader and you got an election, what, in two and a half years' time, and you go up and say, I'm the Liberal Party leader, what does a Liberal Party leader do in two and a half years' time in Victoria? Well, in two and a half years' time in Victoria, they have to have a substantial program of uh, microeconomic reform to actually rebuild uh, the basis of our economy. Uh, Victoria has limited primary industries. We, of course, have agriculture, but there's not much in terms of mining outside of specialised areas. We have manufacturing uh, in some key areas like aluminium and uh, the moulding of metals and die casting and the like as part of component manufacturers. Uh, but most people are in the service-based economy, so you've both got to find ways to make them competitive. Uh, and it's, but it's not just, can't be solved in isolation. The, we, I said in my speech, uh, there's going to be a global race to competitiveness um, for every country around tax, around industrial relations, around affordable energy and the main inputs to the economy. Uh, and we're going to have to be very nimble. So you need a substantial program of reform that leads to investment. And critically, I think what's going to become um, essential is uh, providing different forms of government guarantee which bring private sector capital and mobilise private sector capital to build the future of the state. That's consistent with your ver version of liberalism in a couple of years' time? I'm sorry, I don't quite... That's consistent. I mean, that's a liberal position you regard... Well, I, I, think, I think... It's not an interventionist position? Well, I think um, the, the... It's like tariffs. You know, I, don't, I support free trade, as you know, but when you have a government that creates artificial constructs through tariffs then part of the um, obligation of the state is to undo the damage that occur has occurred. Um, the consequence of well, the free market solution to managing COVID-19 was people take responsibility for their behaviour, they um, respect each other and find that space. Um, instead, we've had the massive interventionist hand of government smash right into the heart of the economy. The reality is we're going to need to rebuild aspects of the structure of, of the very base of the economy. Well, let's go back to Menzies and Chifley briefly, as you know, Menzies was devastated when he didn't win the 1946 election. Of course, he wins in 49. And you look at the essential errors that the Chifley government made was, I would think, on the economic sphere, was continuing the restrictions well beyond the end of the war mm. and attempting to nationalise the private bank. So in a sense, in 1949, there's a reaction to what was then, not immediately after the war, but four years after the war, what was seen to be far too harsh government across wide sections of the economy. You're thinking that might happen again and uh, similar things might happen in two and a half years' time in Victoria? Well, I think the political, the economic consequences of even the lockdown measures where the Victorian economy is basically been locked down now since March um, in different forms. Uh, and while some people have managed to keep things going, what's actually happened is hab habitual changes. And because so much of the economy is based on service-based um, sectors, you know, people going to cafes and restaurants and the like, when you break apart that, it takes a long time to rebuild it. But it's also just an issue of confidence. Savings rates gone up because even if people may not have as much money, uh, or much income, uh, they're much more uncertain about the future. And that's going to be against a global backdrop where uh, there will be um, global, there'll be a global recession as well as what will happen domestically. I think it's very serious. Uh, and I think um, uh, everybody will know in two and a half years' time who is responsible for what will be the huge separation between the situation the rest of the country faces and the unemployment levels will be in Victoria. Today they're talking about unemployment in, Victor in Australia being below 10% um, by the end of the year, higher in Victoria, above 10%. So um, the, the challenge we face are real and what we're going to have to do is find the opportunity in this to not try and reconstruct the economy of the 20th century, it's how to build the economy of the 21st century. As you know, last weekend, uh, Premier Anders in Victoria announced what I think disappointed or grievously disappointed business and others uh, of what the intentions are. But if you look at the way the Premier explains all this, he explains it essentially with reference to modelling. Mm. Now, in your time at the Institute of Public Affairs, you were not a great fan, I think, of modelling and area of climate to, to what extent did this sort of yeah, this is sort of modeling work in relation to COVID-19 well I, I'm not in a best position to understand uh, to give commentary on that because I haven't viewed the modeling but it's the techno technocratic approach to government that is wrong people are elected to take responsibility 
and by abrogating responsibility, shifting onto what a computer model tells you should be done, uh, is to embrace a technocratic approach to government, which essentially inverses society from free people living their lives with measures necessary to preserve the freedom of others to people ultimately being uh, living their lives for the service of the state. And that's where Victoria now is. And it's, it's a completely flawed logic, but it's also, uh, uh, it's a fallacy in terms of an approach to governance because it then only sees the complexity of society through a single lens um, to achieve one objective without any um, proportionality or weighty consequences on any other issues. So we know that, yes, there are people who sadly died before COVID-19 of health conditions. Uh, they do now and they will into the future. But now we're only focusing on COVID-19 ones. We're not worried about mental, or then effect, effectively not really worried about mental health stress. Um, and of course, the most extreme form of that is suicide. They're not concerned about um, the health consequences of delayed uh, uh, elective surgery. Uh, and then of course, add on top of that, the economic consequences as well. Uh, so it's a flawed logic and it's an abrogation of responsibility of government and it will end in a disaster. So with the abrogation of responsibility of government, it seems that the government goes to an aspect, um, the politicians go to an aspect of government, which is the public service. So you've got this, this, uh, this area where non-elected public servants, they're always important in any government, but it seems to be, they seem to speak with the authority that once the government spoke with. Yes, and, and I think people accept a component of that because you've got uh, a health crisis, so you want things to be understood from a health lens, which may not be in uh, uh, necessarily the politician or the premier or, um, area of expertise. But in the end, um, they should not be ones deciding. The, the idea that you can have governments run by experts is a flawed strategy of governance because uh, uh, they're not weighting competing priorities. And this goes all the way back to, we can go back to um, what um, Hayek wrote in the Constitution of Liberty, but ultimately it's about information. And government can never have perfect information. The central authority can never have perfect information. It's through the voluntary actions of uh, millions of people in their daily lives that inform the totality of the information that's available to people. So in the end, you'll basically only make people e uh, servants of the state. With this, with this approach. And public servants uh, doing it, do it with even less accountability and less, um, uh, less capacity to be kept in check because they don't report to a parliament. Now you're a Victorian Liberal speaking out on these issues. And I, I understand that at the moment, if you're an opposition in Victoria, it must be hugely difficult. But we don't hear many of those voices, many people talking the kind of language you're talking today coming out of the Victorian Liberal Party. Are they there or we just don't? Here, the moment we, we hear Josh Frydenberg, but he's in federal politics, but we don't hear much from from the Victorian opposition, even though it's difficult for them to speak on some of these matters. Oh, they speak out um, and they have their voices uh, heard. There's been many good speeches have been given recently, but um, in the end, it, it, like at a federal level, I mean, federal labour is irrelevant to the conversation. They're not a decision maker. And with respect to my um, state colleagues, they're not decision makers either at the moment. Their task is to lay the foundations about why there needs to be a concrete policy reform program put forward in two years' time as an alternative vision for government. The people who are really abrogating their responsibility right now are state members of parliament who know what their government is doing is wrong, and they absolutely exist. And uh, I understand the challenges sometimes of having to defy your own party to get through the right thing, and I have done that. Uh, the state members of parliament, and there are some there and they're within the Labor Party, have made it, um, do make it privately clear that they know what they're doing is wrong uh, and uh, that they're not stepping up to the plate. And this is one of those times, I think, where if you don't stand up and be counted, uh, you will ultimately, you're failing your electors and you deserve electorally what's coming to you. But the bigger problem is that you're going to take the state with you. You've got some interesting endorsements from your book by the former senator Amanda Vanstone, but also from the Prime Minister Scott Morrison, who says the book prod stirs and challenges us. What does he mean? What he means is that um, it, the book actually uh, says some very uncomfortable things for members of the Liberal Party, some people who identify as conservative, some people who uh, identify as liberal. It's I talk a lot about what intergenerational justice in the liberal tradition means. 
I talk about what liberalism itself means and what makes Australian liberalism different to other countries and why that matters. I um, uh, point out the uh, what I believe to be the false logic of identifying as a political conservative um, and then uh, to address some of the big challenges we face, which is what I'm saying is we need to change some of the structures, particularly around tax and how we um, favour some ac economic activity versus others, which um, challenges our electoral base. Um, because my point is if we don't do that, then there won't be a political constituency who will be sufficient to uh, support liberal governance in Australia. In uh, these discussions in these times of pandemic, we ask our members to send in some questions. And one of them says, uh, during the election, you argued that Labor's policy on franking credits constituted a retire retiree tax. Now, in the COVID-19 economy, would not a ceiling on franking credits be appropriate on the grounds of what you're talking about as in a generational equity? So have you backed off on the franking credits? No, no I, I've, I've always believed you need to have a debate around uh, tax and transfers uh, as a holistic discussion. Um, and, I, and I maintain that view very strongly because you can't solve public policy by demonising one section of the community where the Labor Party basically lied and said that it was a public, sec it was a public gift um, to retirees because the discussion around tax and transfer ultimately come to tax and responsibility for people. Uh, and uh, you just need to go and look at the um, Productivity Commission study in 2015 called Tax and Transfer Incidents in Australia to identify who's paying what taxes at what stage of life and who's getting the benefits of them. So you can't fix the problem if you're not going to have a discussion around responsibility as well. Uh, so the point of the book is to say, let's have a deeper conversation, let's get some of these issues on the table, because what I actually argue for is uh, uh, one person who read it said it's quite a radical proposition around tax, which is to um, heavily flatten the tax system, remove a lot of the uh, systems of transfers of wealth so that we have a more liberal society that's sustainable and more intergenerationally just. Another one of our session members says, how will the liberal doctrine respond to the probable post-pandemic retreat from globalisation and free market dogma? Do you see any great changes there? Well, I think there's a, there was, I go through it again in the book about how we've come out of essentially an era of equity extraction, which is what's happened in the post kind of um, Cold War era. And uh, there are a lot of people writing about this now, about how we need to reinvest and build. Uh, Yuval Levin recently from American Enterprise Institute wrote a whole book about this, about institutions, and a very good one, uh, and why we need to rebuild the structures to make it work. And so I recognise that the importance of the neoliberal, if we want to call it that era, and what value it added, because there was a very important idea set at the heart of that. But it's about a rebalancing um, and to get... Um, uh, to it suited a time, but that time is also now over. The other thing, of course, and they mentioned globalisation, is there were already shifts um, in terms of globalisation around supply chains and the like and economic structures uh, that had already started to occur. Um, uh, you know, there, were, there was obviously a very heavy reliance on China. Our relationship with China is, let's just say, um, challenged at the moment. Uh, and that countries are realising that security is going to depend on uh, operating things as much regionally as part of, uh, and hedging risk as comparison to just um, allowing uh, economic issues to be resolved simply by what business wants. Another one of our session members asked the question, uh, well, if you're a Liberal, uh, where do you stand on closing the borders and why isn't the coalition government uh, supporting Clive Palmer's uh, suggested or proposed action on Section 92 to, to free the border between Western Australia and elsewhere? I'm deeply uncomfortable with the borders being closed um, and have said so consistently. I su support that area of law being tested. Now, it's up to the government to decide whether it wants to join the case or not, but uh, I've said on Q&A recently that I am not in favour of border closure and want them as temporary as possible. It sort of, um, uh, ironically, after his spray recently at some of us about superannuation. Um, Paul Keating even came out and said that, you know, border closures are very challenging. Um, there are, there's obviously to manage an immediate crisis around COVID-19, there are proportional measures that can be taken. Nobody's arguing against that. It's whether they're justified and they're sustainable um, beyond the immediate risk. And I'm not convinced that um, border closures are always in favour of uh, the, the challenges we're facing. Now let's go back uh, 
briefly to the people who who you look look up to historically in Australia. Now you you mentioned Robert Menzies. I'll come back to him in a minute. You, I'm not sure. I don't recall that you mentioned Alfred Deakin. I think I mentioned him in passing, yeah. but only in the context of um, uh, I think Paul Kelly's analysis on the. But the were these two ever liberal in the economic sense you're talking about? I grew up in the Menzies years. I, I argued in my book that what was good about Menzies is that he didn't continue what Chifley had done. He didn't continue that, but he didn't wind it back much, except for getting rid of the Commonwealth Oil Refinery, everything else that had been nationalised, stayed nationalised, apart from COR, which my father always bought, because he was an old labour man, and he always bought COR petrol until Menzies had closed it down, which wasn't very popular in our house. But <laughs> Menzies presided over a pretty regulated economy, and he had yeah. no great desire to unregulated. So, I mean, looking at the two of them, John Howard was much more liberal in your sense of the term liberal than Menzies was, because Howard wound back a lot of government changes, a lot of government controls. But a lot of those things are ultimately a reflection of the time. International competition drives behaviour around things, uh, and information technology has driven a lot of behavioural changes uh, and the need to be more globally competitive. So um, the point about the book is that there are aspects of what I think we've done in the past that we need to re-establish because they're a fundamental good for the sustainability of our society and I put particular emphasis on home ownership. But uh, if you want to build the future of the of an Australian economy, it has to be for the 21st century. It can't just be rehashing what was done in the past for the 20th century. And what Howard did was, uh, as, as did Hawke, as did Keating, as did... The drys recognised the need to structurally change Australia's economy so that it had a contribution to the world, and we're going to have to keep doing that. It's not a, it's never a finished exercise. I was about to conclude. Now, I, uh, as I recall, after the election, I argued that uh, I thought you were probably the first backbencher on either side of politics who played a significant role in an election victory, and I put you in with Josh Frydenberg, Scott Morrison, Matthias Corman. Now, you're sitting on the backbench. Writing books. How do you feel about that? I have a. I actually love my job as chair of the House Economics Committee, and I know that will sound like a trite response, but uh, I'm interested in outcomes, um, and so that's how I get my outcomes at the moment. Okay, and if you if you go to the next election, and I assume you win, uh, what does that mean? Another book? <laughs> <laughs> and what would it be on? Uh, no, no, I think the. Uh, this book is, is what I call a foundations book. There's another book that's to come which will be focused on the, uh, on uh, probably closer to what people call that vision thing, uh, but uh, much more in trying to articulate how then do we get to where we need to get to. But because the moments that we're in now are so, um, uh, so uncertain, it's very hard to draw clarity uh, from where we're... If you want to... If you want to draw a map of where you want to be, you've got to know where you're starting from, and I don't even know where we're starting from at the moment. But if you don't know where we're starting from in the future, that's a good place to conclude on. <laughs> so many thanks and good luck with the book. Okay. Thanks, Jared. Thanks, Tim.